Jameson has been a serial entrepreneur for 25 years. He built uh, Arterian, formerly JWCS, an MSP that he grew from a one-man shop to 40 staff through both organic growth and the acquisition of four other IT services companies. He went on to co-found three SaaS companies, including Tematics, Smileback, and TimeZest, and currently serves as a fractional CEO for Smileback and chairman of TimeZest. He enjoys his role as a, a strategic coach and consultant for several clients in the U.S., and he currently lives in Las Vegas and travels constantly. Jameson, really excited to have you join us. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can fire away and uh, have the floor. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. My talk today is really about what we call people in the three C's. Um, so let me just kind of jump right into it. I've got a fair amount of slides. I tend to talk fast, so it won't be a problem. So you just heard from Stephen about the above. Um, one little update is uh, I did sell Smileback to ConnectWise uh, in December, so I'm not the fractional CEO anymore. It was a great ride, um, but uh, a lot of time in the MSP world my entire career. I, I like to say I started when I was seven, but um, I'm well into my 50s. So um, I started my MSP when I was 25, a long time ago, and it's just been a joy being part of this community for so long. Um, and last year, I, I really enjoyed, as I went through the acquisitions and the sale of my MSP, uh, it was really a ride that was a little different than I expected. And so I wrote that book, The Emotional Side of Selling a Small Business. And, uh, it, and for those of you who have ever thought about what an exit might look like, there are a lot of materials. There's a lot out there that could be helpful in terms of thinking about in terms of thinking about uh, valuations and metrics and all of that, not a lot of, I couldn't find a lot of resources that really talked about the rest of it. And so uh, it kind of connects pretty well to my talk today in some ways. Uh, so just take a look if you, if you have any interest in that. So my objectives today are to really talk a bit about what we call the five P's at ConnectStrat. Uh, what are the, how do we think about operational maturity? But my focus today is all around one of them called people. Um, and I'm going to talk about culture, competence, and commitment. And then I'll share with you kind of the tool we use to assess our people and kind of stack rank or think, around, think about how people are aligned to culture from a people perspective uh, in, a, in our organizations. So let me first kind of walk through what the five Ps are. So um, we talk about people, priorities, performance, and process. And at the core of all of that is vision, strategy, execution. It all lies around like being able to step back, see the forest of the trees. We call that perspective. Um, what we know is that the best way to succeed is to have specific intent, a clear vision, a plan of action, and the ability to maintain clarity. So Steve Marabali talks about this, and it's a really clear way to step back and, and kind of have a vision for the future and then work back where, backwards to create absolute clarity in the moment. Um, we think of these as three of our pillars, vision, strategy, and execution. And really when we onboard our clients, we're thinking about how do you develop a vision that has absolute clarity on purpose? How do you create your core values? How do you create that kind of mission and purpose then how do, you, how do you differentiate over the next few years of, in, in, in the organization? And what's your strategy to differentiate and to be relevant in a relatively crowded space? I mean, 40,000 MSPs in North America, roughly. Um, it's hard to differentiate, but there are methodologies for doing so. And then how do you execute? How do you go make it happen? The next P we talk about is priorities, really about like, how do you narrow down that execution into establishing a rhythm for how you meet and talk to, to people, keep those communication circles just perfectly overlapped? How do you establish those key objectives that matter every quarter and manage the things that you need to talk to, prioritize, and just align in a way that ensures that you're executing and holding people accountable within the organization? Performance is all about KPIs and metrics. What gets measured gets managed. We know this. Uh, so being able to step back and have a clear perception of what matters in the organization, being able to narrow that down into numbers and metrics that everybody comprehends, 
and then getting very, very good at predicting what will move, what levers you can pull to modify those KPIs and metrics is so critical in running a successful business. And just maintaining the performance, keeping that engine humming in the way it should. And then process. Uh, it's so critical to have documented your way of doing business and ensuring that everybody in the organization understands and leverages those core processes. That you have a process for maintaining and maturing your processes. So those are just a really quick overview. I have whole presentations on each of those four Ps that I usually go through. But my session today is really about people and the three Cs. And so I want to talk to you, uh, this is really the focus today. I get most passionate about culture and people. Uh, so let's just dive in. Love this quote from Jim Collins, kind of the one of, the, one of the grandfathers of all of this stuff, reflecting on more than a quarter century of rigorous research into what makes great companies tick, I've come to see first who is the one principle above all others you must not get wrong. I'd mentioned the number 40,000 MSPs roughly uh, in North America. I see BHAGs and purpose and core values, and I could probably list off a handful of those and hit 80% of what those of you on on this meeting have in some way, shape, or form. The real differentiator is the people. Um, and it's, the, it's those core values and culture you create that differentiate you from your competitors. The way that we think about our who is this perfect overlap of having the right culture fit, making sure that people are aligned to the behaviors we expect in the organization, being highly competent in their role, understanding what they're accountable and responsible for and being highly competent in it. And then thirdly, being committed to the cause in the organization. And those are the three C's that I'm going to walk through today. So let's first define culture. What is it? Um, it's, a, it's a set of shared values, goals, attitudes, and practices that characterize an organization and it's really all about the emotional and behavioral expectations and alignment to those emotional and behavioral expectations that drive this daily decision making, how they interact with others, how they make decisions, how they behave when, they, when they're interacting with clients. All of those things are guided by a set of shared values and behavior, understanding of what the cultural behavior should be. Why this is so important to your organization is what we call the culture and performance winning formula. And there's really five or six components of this. You need to have the right people in your organization. That's that culture alignment. You need to be very, very clear on your why in the organization. Like Simon Sinek has an incredible book, Start With Why. Uh, have a clear purpose. Have a strategy that matters. This is where some of the more execution systems like EOS and others kind of falter, in my opinion, is that really thinking about what are my three-year differentiating strategies, differentiator, differentiating um, capabilities in my organization that, that create a clear marketplace outcome. And then having a strong playbook that's going back to those processes, being very, very mature in how you do things consistently so that you aren't making repeated mistakes with your clients and with each other. And then really thinking about the health of your team. How do you perform well? That's the KPIs and metrics. That's the performance piece I was talking about. Those, the, the, when you have all of those built well, those five components, you grow and you get profitable. I love this concept of the multiplier effect. The idea of the multiplier effect is that I can take five individuals who have 130 IQ and put them in a room. And if they don't have a healthy culture, or healthy interactions with, it, with each other, all I get is a collection of five differentiated pieces of intelligence that are independently smart and get interesting stuff done. But I can take five people with a 100 IQ who are very, very healthy, and I'll get vastly more out of them. Even though on the individual level, they may not have the IQ of the others, it's their health that's a multiplier effect. So it's so important to say, 
that's that kind of EQ layered on top of the IQ that makes, that's the multiplier of intelligence. And it comes through in both of those ways. So that health is so critical and that health is mostly driven through alignment to core behaviors and cultures. You may have heard this quote that an organization is only as good as its people. I really believe that an organization is only as good as, it, as its people perform, right? So you can have individually good people, but you have to put together a culture that creates performance before you create a great organization. So let's talk a little bit about your people. Um, research has shown, and you, this should resonate with most of you, I think, that roughly 10% of folks in any organization, and I go to, to a large organization like a Microsoft of the world or a much smaller organization like I have Time Zest, we have about 15 people. And you're going to have about 10% of that group that are not just aligned to culture, but are kind of beacons for positive behavior. They're those influencers who just kind of scream positive behavior that you kind of look at and they're leaders because they have the EQ and the, and the, and the cultural norms that pull people positively in their direction. Just those cheerleaders in your organization that you want everybody to follow. And even though they may be in general good culture fits, about 10% of folks in most organizations have a little bit of the Eeyore complex. Um, they tend to be a little bit naysayers, a little bit negative, and behind closed doors or the underground that, that happens in an organization, they can pull people the other direction. They can have negative talk and conversations where they're unintentionally undermining the rest. What happens is 80%, the other 80% tend to just go with the flow. They can be pulled in either direction. And so just understand that if you don't pay attention to the culture of your organization, flip a coin. You have some strong cultural fits that are pulling people one way, some negative ones pulling people the other way, and your folks in the middle are going to go with the flow and you're taking a risk. So what we ask people to do, because accidental or intentional, we want people to be intentional about the design of their culture and then systematic about how they implement it and roll it out. So let's walk through that a little bit. First, and this may be counter to what a lot of you think or have learned, is we strongly believe it at ConnectStrat that you should use a culture guide, a set of specific behaviors instead of just loose core, value, core values. I've been on stage in front of many and listed 10 words and asked everybody in the crowd to stand up if I hit over half of their core values and I can get 90% of the people in the room to stand up. I'm, I'm guessing that at least a few of you are looking at these simple four right here and going, yeah, you, you nailed one or two of my, my core values there. Well, welcome to everybody who has this set of high level core values uh, that aren't overly helpful. An idea of a core value when it's just left alone without greater definition is respect. Um, I have a partner at ConnectStrat who grew an MSP to about $50 million, merged with another $50 million MSP. Number one investor was the third most wealthy guy in South Korea. He went to meet him and he's from Texas. Um, the, the folks who were assisting and managing this very wealthy person in South Korea actually taught my partner how to, how to behave and how to show respect. But when it came time to meet him in person, it all went out the window and in full Texas style said, damn glad to meet you and shook his hand and looked him in the eye. So from a core value perspective, based on his environment, how he grew up, how he was taught, he absolutely showed the core value of respect, but the actual literal behavior that he showed was completely misaligned. So remember, core values are very, very difficult. If I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody about a core value, we can have differing opinions about the definition of the word. But if I get very specific about a behavior, be fanatic about response time, practice blameless problem solving, there's very little subjectivity in the conversation. So instead of four or five core values, uh, we work with our clients to think about 25, 30 critical behaviors that really define how we act with each other and with our clients. 
we greatly encourage people to develop a culture guide. This is a small sample of one that I used um, in my MSP back in the day, Arterian in Seattle. We were very, very specific about what it meant to act with integrity, how we added value, what humility looked like, how we were accountable, how we're a team player, um, how we didn't ever bring, we leave baggage at the door when we walk into the office, what it looked like to be on time. Um, Those types of very clear behaviors allow your managers to have more clear and consistent conversations with your people, especially when they're complicated and there's a behavior question. Instead of this light, subjective feeling that people aren't quite behaving in line with our core values, we get to be specific. Once we've designed this culture guide, we begin to step back and say, we need to operationalize our culture. So we, we do this by creating rituals. So rituals require repetition, which create internalization. So let's, we're kind of working backwards from that graphic you see on the screen right now. I'm, I'm guessing that more than a couple of you have seen a senior engineer who says, I am too busy and can't enter my time or document this ticket. Um, and mostly because they've never internalized or repeated a ritual that said, this is just habit. They haven't created a habit of putting time in before they leave a ticket, and move to the next one. They haven't created a habit of documenting what it is they're doing before they move on. Every client I have has struggled with that, if not in current in some time in the past. So I like to ask folks who are in that world, uh, do you get out of bed in the morning, get ready for work and leave uh, your home without having brushed your teeth? And I'll bet those same people who don't put time and documentation post ticket, brush their, at least I hope they do, brush their teeth before they leave home in the morning. And how did that happen? Because their parents, when they were children, created a ritual that created a ha- habit through daily repetition where it was so internalized, it's not even a second thought. I didn't think about it. I, put my toothbrush in, brush. It's just a natural part of my morning, like many other rituals and habits we've created. And the way that we think about our behaviors and work should be done in exactly the same way. So that's how we begin to operationalize our culture. We can create rituals in a handful of ways. I love leveraging a culture guide and hiring, evaluating, and developing employees. So an example of this for me is I was typically the culture interview with prospective employees at my MSP. And perhaps I should have been the first interview. I was usually the last interview in the series. But I would have a prospective employee come in uh, to meet with me, let's say a one o'clock interview. My assistant would give this prospective employee a copy of our culture guide and ask them to just spend 10 or 15 minutes deeply digesting this, you know, two page, just two sides of an eight and a half by 11 laminated. They were all over our office. Just read it. And if this excites you, if this is the kind of environment you want to be in, then please, Jameson would love to meet with you. But if it's not, if you're not excited about this, or if you're questioning, it doesn't feel right to you, then save yourself and Jameson some time because you'll never last here. This is how we behave with each other. And I had nearly half of my interviews get up and walk out of the door because it was truly differentiated. It was truly explaining some things that were important to us that some folks in unhealthy environments, in my opinion, because we were describing a healthy culture, knew that they wouldn't be able to align with. The second thing that we did to create rituals was focusing on a behavior each week and putting in our weekly meeting agenda. So starting with the leadership team, then with departmental meetings, being able to just cycle through them one at a time. Instead of saying, we've got these five core values and quarterly, we're going to talk about them at an all hands meeting and everybody has to remember them and memorize what they are. Put all that aside and every week grab one and just talk about what it looks like to highly be aligned with this behavior and what it looks like are examples of when we've broken down and missed this behavior within the organization and celebrate an individual who clearly showed that in the recent past, have a conversation about that. The beauty of that is that you're, you know, if you have 25 behaviors, you're hitting them twice a year. So it's not super repetitive. It doesn't feel gimmicky or corporate. It's very, very specific. Here's what it means to leave your baggage at the door. We know everybody has personal lives, but when we come in, some people, you know, that, that ability to not bring it into our work environment and be professional and be empathetic to each other that they all have 
you know, things going on in their personal lives, but we're here to do a job and not put that weight on other people really makes for outstanding performance in the organization and keeps team health high. That would be an example of having the conversation. And oh, by the way, Joe Bob, we know he's been going through a lot, but he doesn't bring it into work. He comes in with a positive, positive attitude and supports his teammates every day. So celebrate it a little bit. And everybody kind of can start thinking about, wow, I, I've been bringing my junk into the office um, and I need to rethink that because they're, they're showing what that looks like to behave and align with that, with that culture, cultural expectation. And so that goes to the third one. Recognize employees that are consistently behaving according to your culture guide. I love the idea of every time somebody's super aligned or behaving in a way that you can just drill into a specific behavior and say, yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. Shout it from the rooftops, put it in teams, do whatever you do to connect with the rest of your people around that behavior and, and demonstrate what that looks like. And if somebody, if you are facing a difficult conversation with an employee, and the, it's the easiest thing to train your managers to do this as well, is as soon as they're having a feeling that something went wrong, or there's a culture problem or a behavior problem with an employee, sit down with the culture guide and highlight the one, two, three, four behaviors that were off. And in private, never in public, sit down with that employee and go through the core, the expectations of the culture guide and get aligned with why the frustration's there. I'm a conflict avoider. I don't mind other people's conflict. I just don't like having it my own. Just like metrics do for performance, a culture guide does for behaviors. It's not me telling you you shouldn't behave this way. It's this document that you've agreed to be part of. It's this culture you agreed to join, and now you're behaving in a way that's objectively not aligned to the expectations. So there's this quote out here, good companies have good cultures by chance. World-class companies have world-class cultures by design. This just kind of really sums up why it's so important that you design and implement the culture that you want in your organization. Okay, I'm going to move past culture into the second C, which is competence. Competence is all about the ability to get more efficient and then create high performance in your role. And it's super critical to be able to evaluate somebody's capacity to do a task, be accountable, be responsible. So let's talk about that a little bit. We talked about having the right people on the bus. You probably heard this quote. It's better to first get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats, and then figure out where to drive. This is the same thing as the people first con uh, concept, right? It, first is the culture, getting all the right people on the bus and the wrong people off. Then you need to get the right people in the right seats. I, I've seen companies struggle with saying, we have these incredible culture fits and they start making up and creating seats for people that they don't really need or forcing round pegs into, scrum, into round holes by putting people into seats that they're not truly competent to perform in. So let, I want to talk about how we think about competence and what the underlying component for this is. It's called a, an accountability chart, a functional accountability chart. Um, you've probably heard of this, but I want to, before I dive into this, I want to get very clear that an accountability chart is somewhat different than an org chart. An org chart is an HR reporting, like who reports to who and manages who, there's typically a, and it's, it's a one-to-one -one ratio of people, right? One box represents one person, period. An accountability chart typically isn't built that way. And in a smaller organization, like most of my clients at ConnectStrat, uh, most of our clients at ConnectStrat, especially at the top level of leadership, folks tend to have maybe two, three, I've even got a smaller client or two that has four or five roles in the organization. But it's so important to create clarity about what they're accountable for, not just as an individual, but with each of the hats they wear in the organization. It creates this incredible amount of clarity as, the companies, as companies begin to grow and scale. So every company needs to have a conductor. And the conductor role is really that individual at the top, it may be the owner. It's not always the owner. Um, it may be a COO or a president, but it's that, 
it's that, and I'm not, I don't get caught up on titles. They're not really important to me, but the conductor role is all about understanding balance across the organization. And ultimately is usually accountable for the EBITDA or profit, the bottom line of the business, because they need to understand financially how all the pieces flow. Ultimately, all the people roll up to them. They are able to get operationally in the weeds as needed, but they're really out there literally acting as the conductor for the business. And then there are three major roles on leadership team that can be split out. Um, But ultimately, any for-profit organization has these three basic uh, legs of the stool. You have to get work, you have to do work, and you have to get paid, right? So let's talk about what those are. Get work. Get work is marketing and sales, anything you do to drive business into the organization. Do work is everything you operationally deliver, professional services, managed services, maybe client success, VCIO services. And then get paid is all that back office, principally finance function, but that could be HR functions. It could be internal IT, although some MSPs leverage their do work operational side for that, for that leg of the stool. So there could be multiple, like sales and marketing could be one role or it could be two roles, but this ultimately creates your leadership team is getting absolute clarity on these roles. And what I also love about this is you get very, very clear on those simple elements of the P&L that each of these roles are accountable for. Get work is about revenue. Do work is about cost of goods sold and margin. Get paid is about GNA, general and administrative expenses. And then the conductor understands how those three elements work together to create profit or EBITDA. It's a very, very simple way to align what people's priorities and metrics are to create a successful organization. Once you've decided what those roles are, of course, they flow all the way down to you know, an admin assistant, a, a marketing assistant, a tier one tech, knock. Um, it rolls down into all those roles. You need to get very, very clear on what the accountability or function for those roles are. So sales and marketing might be, just an example, not saying it should be, if they have anybody reporting to them, the number one thing that any role is accountable for, if there's anybody else beneath them on the accountability chart is to lead and manage two very, very different things. But they need to be leaders and managers for their people because as you go, so go they. You exponentially create you know, the cost of poor leadership and management goes all the way down through the department, not just to the individual who's in that role. But then some other things here, sales and marketing, you might be accountable, of course, for marketing process, hitting their sales quota, actually closing. If you're a working, working salesperson, this would be an example of a smaller organization maybe account management, although a lot of my, most of my clients actually have account management, the operation side, a constant debate. But the, but the idea is what are you accountable for? And you want to get very, very specific with the four, five, six bullets of accountability in each of these roles. And then ultimately, create KPIs that show what success looks like in that function. So um, marketing, it may be how many you know, MQLs or SQLs is what you really want out of marketing. I want, we want to get all the point to a sales qualified lead, right? And then sales numbers would be a quota number. And then closing might be a close ratio. Uh, account management might be an NPS score or project sales. Like there, I, can, I can immediately come up by looking at this list of accountable items that somebody's accountable for, what metrics I might put in place for the sales and marketing department to say, here's how we're going to measure performance and success so you know how well you are performing, how competent, getting back to that second, see how competent you are in your role. And then we need to identify out of all the right people in the bus, who should be sitting in that seat? Who's going to be the right person to sit in that seat? And I will tell you, in my work with our clients, we we have to put somebody in a seat, but we may not have somebody who's perfectly qualified to perform in that seat. Um, sometimes we have to live with that. Oftentimes, as an example, sales and marketing for smaller clients, sometimes that's the owner. Um, sometimes it's the conductor who might also be the owner. 
until we get to the point that we can afford to put people in these roles as we scale and grow, we have this clarity. So let's say there's an owner, a company who's like, yeah, I wear the finance hat and the sales hat. I have a marketing assistant. Uh, I have somebody doing sales over or service oversight, but ultimately I'm doing all the surrounding roles. And I never thought of it as five different full-time jobs I'm doing. Well, you are, and you're the owner and you need to think of it that way. And as you begin to grow and scale, you need to start saying, what's my highest and best use? And how do I identify, qualify somebody to do that role so I can do what's, what my genius is so I can perform at a higher level and allow other people to step into roles that, that create scalability and growth within the organization. You want to constantly evaluate your accountability chart. This is a living, breathing document. Um, it's important that we know if there's more than one person in a seat. Now, at the leadership team level, that's, you just can't do that at accountability. At the accountability level, when we kind of get lower in the accountability chart, like we might have tier one engineer, and maybe there's five of them, and they have a set of responsibilities different than an accountability. Accountability is one throat to choke. Um, or responsibilities like a job duty or how I execute. So, they may be a like, tier one engineer might be CSAT and ticket close and, and utilization and a few handful of KPIs or metrics they're individually responsible for, but it's a shared set of accountabilities to handle all these tier one tickets. Can you have a person in more than one seat? I already talked about that. You may at the top, usually at the top have, have folks, leaders who are in more than one seat. Every now and then a senior engineer will be both a project engineer, but also handling some escalations on the support side, well, I would submit that's two different roles that person's sitting in and they have to know when they're switching hats and you have to be able to account for that. Um, just be very, very aware of people being in more than one seat so they have clarity on what they're accountable, accountable for. Do you have any of the right people, culture fits, who are sitting in the wrong seat? They aren't good at accountability in that role. They can't perform. Do you have any empty seats? You have to fill them until you have to fill them with somebody because if, if you get really robust in your accountability chart and you've listed what folks are accountable and there's nobody sitting in that seat, it's very easy to identify where things are getting dropped. So somebody has to sit there until you can find the right person. The need training, I would say the competence is the one piece of this puzzle that you can move the needle on. You can move the needle on all three, culture and, and commitment but it's very, very hard to move the needle on culture and commitment. It's much easier to move the needle from competence because through training and experience, people can evolve into being far more competent in specific roles. And then finally, the need to rehire. Um, if you don't have the right, if you can't, if you can't identify, if you have somebody who's in the wrong, maybe they're the right person, they're in the wrong seat, there's not another seat for them, then you are really then you need. Then you've identified how you need to go rehire or put somebody in that seat to perform well. And then review and revise and share. So I have perfect is the enemy of good. I love that quote. It's so so true. This is a living, just like your process document, your your way of doing things, your your playbook is what I would call it. Your playbook, your accountability chart, and your culture guide. They're meant to be living, breathing documents that you review, revise, and share. So I've had some clients get so nervous about releasing accountability chart that they built it and it took them a year before they shared it with anybody. That lack of clarity creates all kinds of consternation and confusion in the organization. Even if you're concerned about how people might understand the accountability chart, sharing it and being willing to have those discussions and revise it for clarity is so important. So I just want to kind of run through this. It's like if, if you routinely struggle with tasks being missed, it's a sign that your business activities are tied to people, not systems. We have to tie business activities to systems and a clear structure for you and your team is the first step towards developing competence and creating a strategy for how your business operates. Emith, great book. I love it. Emith Revisited. Um, take a look at it if you haven't read it. It really helps you start to understand why uh, that structure is so critical. The third and final C I want to hit on here is commitment. Sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit there. It is the, it's the view of an, of an organization member's psychology or attachment to the organization they work for. 
And it's pivotal around whether they will stay and work passionately towards the purpose and BHAG of the organization or just check in and check out. So Simon Sinek, again, all about purpose. Start with why. If you hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe in what you believe, they'll work for you with blood and sweat and tears. Just let digest that a little bit. And there's three ways that we think about people kind of in three areas we call commitment rings. The outer ring, the ones in this, in this commitment ring are folks who just think of what they can get out of the team and the company rather than its success. It's that what's in it for me mentality. Maybe I flip burgers at McDonald's and I work from eight to five. I show up at 8.04, I check in, I grumble through my day. I can't wait to get out. I check out at 4.55, I'm out of there running. And all I was there to do is to make $12 an hour. Um, and that's it. What's in it for me, the paycheck. I don't care at all about the organization or the customers. I'm just there for me. The middle ring, which is super common, are those who think about the team and the company, but they're just observing. It's like, they can be cheerleaders, positive, they can participate, right? And that middle ring, and you all, have, you all know these people. I love this last piece. It's that put me in coach mentality. They are constantly saying, how do I contribute in a way that pulls the company forward? We used to write here, like people who put the company before themselves. It's not about time. It's not about not self-care, not... It's not about a lack of self-care and putting the company over everything, but these are the kind of people who can sometimes get in trouble with that, right? Who will log in and check an email or jump on a ticket at midnight or not leave because a client's down. And it's like, I've got to, you know, I got to run home. I just been a long day. It's like, no, this client's on fire. Like, like, let me help. Let me be there for my team. Let me make sure that this client's okay. And the company's okay. Those people are those highly committed folks. And it makes such a difference. You need to get aligned on this. Set an example by share your goals, but also be really, really clear about the vision of the organization and the purpose. Communicate that every day so that people get aligned, not just to the paycheck they receive, but the reason they're there. And, and you will start to see those folks who have commitment move towards higher levels in the organization. You see them driving the organization forward. Transparency is so critical. When you create goals, whether they're quarterly goals for the leadership team or annual goals for the business or whatever they are, ensure that those ones that are shared value are shared constantly with the rest of the team. I like to have quarterly company meetings, review how well we did against our goals, talk about what every member of the leadership team is striving to do. What are your big initiatives? Get people excited about the why for those initiatives. We are moving things forward that are going to that are going to lead us toward our BHAG. That are an example of why we're here doing this work. Encourage participation in those goals. So we often talk about either annual goals or quarterly rocks in an organization. Well, the more you can create milestones or activities or tasks for folks in the organization in, in an organization to feel like the work they're doing is contributing towards the purpose and outcome of the organization. And they don't just feel like a cog in a wheel that has no effect. It's a massively different uh, impact on their commitment and loyalty to the organization. And give them some accountability. Um, it, I like to think of accountability. It's almost like I gave you know, my, my boys when they were young, we would go bowling and I would put up the bumpers on the side and say, look, your, your goal, your, what you're accountable for is knocking down pins. And here's the lanes you're going to work on. And I'm going to protect those lanes for you for a while. And eventually I moved those lanes down and they understood that they weren't supposed to get a gutter ball and try to get the pins. But I start to open up the freedom for them to take individual ownership and accountability for how they perform uh, within the boundaries that I've set for them. What are the behavioral boundaries? What are the operational boundaries? Give them ownership, find ways to create that mutual trust, and that will drive commitment. And then document, document, document. Um, we, I, I love to implement systems and platforms for my clients so that they have clarity, can work every week on how they're moving through their goals and tasks so that they're, so that they're achieving what they want to achieve as a team. It makes it easy for folks to hold each other accountable 
and create more commitment on team. This is all Lencioni five dysfunction stuff if you're recognizing that as I walk through it. Abraham Lincoln said, commitment is what transforms a promise into reality. Just people commit to it. It's great. The last thing I wanted to share with you um, is uh, kind of a, what we call the three C's assessment tool. I'm happy to have, you can download it um, off my website, off our website. Uh, the concept's really simple. Um, you can, you put in your company name and, and a date and simply list your team members down the left, a culture score from one to 10, 10 being highly cultural fit, regularly behaving in alignment with your cultural behaviors. Even if you just have core values right now, you, I can almost guarantee you could get a sense on the team of yeah, they're about a five or no, they're full on 10. They, they behave exactly in alignment with how we expect or want. Within their role, are they competent, highly competent, performing all the time, super reliable? I know it's going to get done as a five. And wow, failing, not doing a great job, probably a two or a one. And then you, I told you about the commitment rings, those threes just being those super put me in coach, highly committed folks versus the ones just checking in, checking out for a paycheck. And you can get that assessment. And I think if I'm not mistaken, we probably have the tools from all five P's at this link. If you just go to connectstrat.com slash five P's, um, you will see, I think, I think we even have a copy of the presentation there if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So you'll be able to uh, kind of go back through this if you have any questions or kind of want to want to see what I talked about again. And that is uh, the predominant components of my of my presentation. Is there any questions? Any feedback, Stephen? Yeah, Jameson, uh, phenomenal stuff. And just for everyone's edification here, when, when Jameson and I were uh, batting back and forth uh, leading up to today, <clears throat> he was able to take, man, Jameson, what was the, you, you've got so many different decks and different presentations and, and like one really long one. And so you did a great job of kind of condensing material that you've built over the years into this really tight, uh, phenomenal presentation. So thank you very much for, for your insight. Um, are, are there, are there questions? Um, I have got a couple of things that I want to maybe, um, ask you Jameson, just for clarification, but maybe while I'm doing that people, if you do have questions, either put them in the chat or, or unmute and, and fire away. But let me just, uh, lead with, let me just lead with this. You, you talked about the accountability chart. That is something that needs to be constantly revisited. Yeah. Um, in your, in your research and, and work with clients and your experience, what, what's a good rhythm for that? Like when you say always revisit it, is that like a quarterly rhythm? Is that a monthly, like, what have you found to be a good uh, rhythm for that? Yeah. I, I, and I think there's different elements of the, of the answer. So forgive me, but I think in terms of a review of just being able to look and ask if the structure's right at least quarterly. You want to be able to look at it and be able to say by department, like department heads are looking at it and saying, yeah, I can really see how the team's flowing. I understand how the processes overlay the account because usually the process and the accountability chart overflow, right? So you say, here's a process that goes from this role to this role, to this role, and it, com it perfectly connects to the roles. And as soon as a process or the accountability chart change, you need to make sure those stay congruent. And those are both living things, right? So you're, you're constantly checking on them. Um, I'm pretty aligned to really stepping back and asking the big question, is this working for us from the top level? Do we have the right leaders divided departmentally? Are we, do we, I've got a couple clients this last year that have said, we need to create a security team at the leadership level um, it's going to, you know, and they've literally created a new leadership role in their leadership team around security. Some of them decided to layer security into their professional services and managed services practice. So it really depends on the organization. I like to do that annually, at least, which is really stepping back and saying, all right, we are constantly going in and changing individual roles, accountabilities. Maybe we're fixing a bullet and saying, ooh, nobody, we're moving procurement from account management over to finance. 
right? So we're just moving about that. It should, you guys should be able to do that in flight, like be able to say procurement needs to be in one box, one box only, but it's been sitting in the wrong box. We're going to move it to another box. You could do that in a weekly meeting and just say, we're making a change, right? But annually, you will probably want to step back and look at the overall structure and through growth and change, shifts in strategy, you may make a decision to make some kind of a wholesale change to the accountability chart, which is that's called a reorg, right? And, and I like to look a year out and say, what's going to serve us for the next year? What's going to get this done? Nice. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for that. <clears throat> any, other, any other questions or, or comments for, for Jameson? No pressure. It's all well, good. I'll just jump in there. So I can say, who, who owns the accountability chart? I think I know um, the answer, Yeah, I it's know interesting. Um, I, I really do believe it's a collaborative conversation at the leadership team level to start, usually driven principally, like most decisions, by the conductor, because the conductor can see the forest through the trees, right? There's, they, they see that balance and they're like, look, I need... I need to understand how marketing creates SQLs for sales, creates onboarding for projects, creates MRR for managed services. And, and then we have the financial and HR functions to support all of our internal clients, right? So they see the force of the trees and they may see this burning need to say, we have a function, uh, maybe it's client success. And is, is that mean it's account management under operations? Does that mean there's VCIOs at a at a whole nother deliverable at the at the top level. Does that mean that it's a sales function under sales? And they need to understand how all the processes and workings and culture support how an accountability chart would support the organization. Once at the highest level, those decisions are made. I love to have department heads now think about their individual. You know, now it's now it's going down from there. Hey, I'm going to build out a, a managed services. I've got proactive support. Knock. I've got reactive support, service desk. Um, I've got, you know, whatever, whatever I might have, you know, te technology alignment. And maybe I have, you know, two, three teams with heads. And then they get involved in how their team should run and support the processes that they're accountable for. And that's part of like starting to release accountability. So some organizations will dictate it all the way down. But I go back to that bowling lanes thing, right? As soon as you get comfort that, wow, my service manager is really understands how his people or her people work and the processes that drive that, I'm going to take my hands off the wheel and let them, you know, make the recommendations and create that their component of the accountability chart. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Jameson. Yeah. I think it's reviewing this regularly is important. Like, are we living it? Like I've been following traction, like following traction for 10 years. I got yep. the cover on my, my wall here and stuff. But it's actually only the last month where some of these things that you mentioned are actually starting to gel that we had all the names on the charts and the titles and that's all great. But we didn't say, hey, here's the top five responsibilities. It's just a whole, list, a whole list of 20 things. So not, yeah, it's got to be simple. It's got to be five. It's got to be specific. And then what are those three metrics? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and without that's that, it's you're kind of fooling yourself that you're, you're doing it. But it's the, it's the core of the traction system is the accountability chart. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a big part of it. Jameson, I've got a question here from uh, Scott. And, and Scott, you may need to unmute and, and uh, give a little context to this. I'll read the question. And, and if it's straightforward enough, fire away, Jameson. But uh, sure. Scott, be ready to chime in. So is ConnectStrat similar in nature to service leadership? You know, I wouldn't say that we're overtly similar to service leadership. We've partnered with service leadership and we're pretty heavily partnered with ConnectWise and service leadership, you know, started as, I mean, I've been a part of, you know, I was HTG starting 15 years ago. So I go way, way back with Paul Dipple and, and team um, who recently retired, by the way. Uh, but uh, service leadership was really focused on normalization of the chart of accounts for financial metrics. And then ultimately with their sleek tool has begun to do assessments on operational maturity, which is wonderful, but they don't do necessarily the coaching and consultative work to help guide people through that maturity process. Um, 
the three, my three, I have two co-founders. So there's three of us that are founding members of Connect Strat. We have several other coaches. You can see us on the website. We're in the UK and Australia. Um, we, the three co-founders, we used to be EOS implementers for years. Um, but what we developed with Connect Strat were these four pillars uh, and impact, impact vision, strategy, and execution. And EOS only did that execution pillar, very, very strong at execution. But they franchise, they won't let anybody talk about anything else. It's very restrictive and difficult to be entrepreneurial and forward thinking. It was very rigid and structured, very well done. Gino's a great guy, um, another EO member. So I, I you know, worked with him. He and I spoke together at IT Nation even a few years ago. Um, but we found that owners were wanting to understand kind of their life legacy goals. That's the impact pillar. How does this matter to me? How do I make sure that? The business is working for me and I'm not just working for the business. Vision, there's a little bit of that in EOS. Strategy, none of that in EOS. Stratop is a, is a system that a lot of folks were leveraging. And then coaching, right? Like strategic coaching um, or executive coaching. So being able to blend all of those and deliver all of that kind of leadership level up uh, coaching uh, is, is where our focus is. It's being more holistic because we had clients who were going to four three, four, five folks for this kind of help. And some of them couldn't even spell MSP. So that was a problem uh, we wanted to be able to, to, to help with. Yeah. 